Hi, I'm Cracked Senior Editor Josh Sargent, and the Second Amendment guarantees an individual's right to keep a firearm for personal defense. This has been, across the board, the accepted interpretation since all the way back in 2008, because that was when the Supreme Court overturned 200 years of earlier decisions, all of which had said the exact opposite. If you're under a different impression about what that amendment meant, then don't feel bad, because everybody else was too. Even Michael Moore, in the middle of his documentary about how much guns sucked, didn't think to challenge this. Why don't you unload the gun? Because uh, um, the Second Amendment gives me the right to have it loaded. Oh, I agree. I no. totally agree with that. This misconception all comes back to one organization, the NRA. Far be it from me to criticize the work of one of America's most powerful lobbying groups, so I'll just let Supreme Court Justice Warren Burger do it for me. A well-regulated militia being necessary for the defense of the state, the people's rights to bear arms. This has been the subject of one of the greatest pieces of fraud, I repeat the word fraud, on the American public by special interest groups that I have ever seen in my lifetime. That guy was appointed by Ronald Republican Jesus Reagan. But before I get started explaining what Berger means there, let me clarify something. This isn't a pro-gun control video. I won't be arguing for or against any specific interpretation of the Second Amendment. What I will be saying is that the NRA is so inconsistent and dishonest that they are bad for the gun debate even if you agree with them. The NRA has not always opposed gun control. In the early 20th century, they not only supported gun regulation, but helped write the first waiting period laws and created the idea for handgun permits. NRA President Carl Frederick testified before Congress in 1934 that he had never believed in the general practice of carrying weapons or the promiscuous toting of guns, and he thought ownership of the weapons should be sharply restricted. Compare that to NRA President Charlton Heston, who in 2000 waved a rifle around and challenged everyone in the room to fight him for it. From my Cold, dead hands. It all comes back to what's known as the Revolt at Cincinnati. In 1977, gun control was gaining serious traction in Washington. And rather than tackle this issue head on, the NRA actually decided to move away from that scene by literally moving out of Washington, D.C. to Colorado. A lot of people didn't like this. Some because it meant they couldn't live the hard partying lifestyle of political activists anymore. According to one NRA member, they were upset that they weren't being invited to parties anymore. Two of these guys were Neil Knox and Harlan Carter. In May of 1977, they and about a thousand other low-level NRA members hijacked a meeting by thumbing through every bylaw and loophole in the NRA's rulebook they could find. By 3.30 a.m., the NRA's entire leadership had been kicked out and replaced by now Officer Neil Knox and Executive Vice President Harlan Carter, both of whom opposed any gun control legislation at all. That seems extreme, but it's nothing compared to the fact that Neil Knox thought the assassination of JFK and Martin Luther King were part of a gun control conspiracy, saying that there had been far too many coincidences to ignore. So we're talking about a white guy who thinks the U.S. government assassinated Martin Luther King Jr. to inconvenience convenience him. Also, Knox thought someone pointing a gun at another person and pulling the trigger, and then that person dying, was a coincidence. Another weird coincidence is this camera crew that just happened to be here filming at the same moment that I showed up with a script about how crazy the NRA is. It's working out really well for me, but still. Another thing worth mentioning is that NRA Executive Vice President Harlan Carter shot and killed a 15-year-old boy named Ramon Cassiano in 1931 and was convicted of murder, only to have that conviction later overturned because the judge hadn't explained self-defense law to the jury adequately. Carter hid this fact for 50 years until newspapers uncovered it in 1981, and then he spent as long as he could denying that it ever happened. Carter was also an award-winning sharpshooter. So when Carter and Knox took over, the NRA changed the entire purpose of its existence and became 100% about politics. It is also, in another coincidence, the moment they abandoned honesty forever. Between 1888 and 1959, every single law review article on the Second Amendment concluded either explicitly or implicitly that the Second Amendment did not guarantee the individual's right to own a gun. And the only reason my point starts in 1888 is because before then, we weren't keeping track of law review articles. Back then, the Second Amendment was about as controversial as the Ninth Amendment, which is such a boring amendment that you don't even know what it is. No, that's the Ninth Commandment. No, that's the Ninth Dual Commandment from the musical Hamilton. Those are the nine members of the Supreme Court. That's the director of the Ninth Gate. That's an animal that, according to urban legend has nine lives. Uh, one more. Ah, there we go. Ah, that was a worthwhile use of everyone's time. Interestingly, the politics surrounding the Second Amendment changed right when the NRA got involved. The very first legal scholar to argue that the Second Amendment supported the right to individual gun ownership was Stuart R. Hayes in 1960, and he cited the NRA's American Rifle magazine in his opening. By the 1970s, the NRA was sponsoring legal seminars and funding research to encourage this exact kind of thinking. Some more dates. Between 1912 and 1959, there were 11 articles published about the Second Amendment. Between 1980 and 1989, 
it was 38. The next decade, it was 87. And each year, more and more supported the NRA's position. It came out of nowhere, and by nowhere, I mean all of the NRA's money. What's weird is that you don't actually need the Second Amendment to fight for individual gun rights. If we decide the Second Amendment is just about militias, you can still argue that people can buy guns because of the Ninth Amendment. Remember that one? It guarantees the people all the other rights the First Eight Amendments don't spell out. The whole argument doesn't have to live and die on the second one. So it's clear the NRA just focused on the Second Amendment because it's simple and good advertising. Think about it. If the Bill of Rights were Star Trek movies, that means the Ninth Amendment is Star Trek Insurrection, where everyone's run out of steam and Riker thinks he knows how to direct. But the Second Amendment is Wrath of Khan, which features Ricardo Montalban's chest and one of the most iconic moments in film history. It's short, it's rad, and it makes great propaganda. And this is probably why... You'd think if American gun ownership was such an important part of our nation's founding, it'd be easy to find evidence. Instead, the NRA is always going for stuff like this. Now, the quote, free men do not ask permission to bear arms, first appeared online in 2001. It's nowhere in Jefferson's writing. Meanwhile, the Jefferson quote, no free men shall ever be debarred the use of arms, is from his first draft of the Virginia Constitution. The second and third draft added the qualifier within his own lands, and the final draft didn't include the phrase at all. It's a sentiment Jefferson decided he didn't want written down anywhere, and the NRA is now paying homage to him by printing it on thousands of t-shirts. And the lies aren't contained to their swag. In 1996, the NRA fought successfully to prevent the Center for Disease Control from receiving funding to research guns because they thought the CDC was unfairly biased against them. And when this gets brought up, they always cite the same evidence. First, they have a quote from Dr. Patrick O'Carroll in the Journal of American Metal Association, where he said that he was going to use his work to systematically build the case that owning firearms causes death. Second, they have Mark Rosenberg writing the Public Health Policy for Preventing Violence, recommending allowing only police guards and the military to have guns, or the outright ban of gun ownership. And third, they have Rosenberg again, saying that he envisions a long-term campaign to convince Americans that guns are, first and foremost, a public health menace. If you Google these quotes, you'll see they not only appear on the NRA's website, but in op-eds stretching back for two decades, plus thousands of condescending Reddit posts, every single one of which I have read, please help me. They're popular because they seem pretty damning, but I looked those quotes up, and in context, none of them are proof or even vaguely suggest that the CDC is biased against guns. The comment from Patrick O'Carroll is not from an article written by O'Carroll, but from an interview with him where he specifically said the purpose of his work is not to bring about gun control. He's quoted saying the thing from the website, but the very next issue, the JAMA published a letter from Dr. Carroll where he calls that quote out specifically, saying he never said it, and then such an approach would be anathema to unbiased scientific research. Because it would be. The first quote from Rosenberg is actually a quote from a chart published in the middle of Rosenberg's article. A chart that lists several possible approaches to curbing gun violence, but doesn't recommend any of them. In fact, it's printed right above a paragraph where Rosenberg says that firearm injuries can be reduced without banning guns. The second Rosenberg quote is actually a quote from the interviewer and comes right between two more statements where Rosenberg says he doesn't want to ban guns. I can keep going. The NRA published an article saying that Rosenberg said in an interview with the Washington Post that we should think of guns like cigarettes, dirty, deadly, and banned. Except if you read the interview, you see that in context, he's not talking about banning guns. He's suggesting educating people on their dangers and moving away from promoting them as cool. Also, cigarettes aren't banned. Also, the interview wasn't in the Washington Post, it was in the New York Times. The NRA's recklessness with the printed word does not make me want to trust them with an assault rifle. It seems like the real reason NRA wanted to defund the CDC had nothing to do with their studies methodology, but because they didn't like the results, which was stuff like guns kept in the home are associated with an increase in the risk of homicide by family member, and there is no evidence of a protective benefit from gun ownership in any subgroup. I don't know if the CDC CDC is biased against gun control. There might be plenty of evidence out there to make that argument, but the NRA has not found it. All they've done is dominate the discussion like a drunk uncle screaming about Monica Lewinsky and ruining what was just a couple seconds ago a very nice Thanksgiving dinner. But the NRA's efforts to prevent gun violence research, known as the Dickey Amendment, have been effective. Now to be clear, the Dickey Amendment actually just prevents the CDC from advocating or promoting gun control. They can technically still perform studies, but they don't. Because as I just showed, the NRA interprets I don't support a gun ban as meaning I secretly support a gun ban. So it's no surprise that they make the CDC too nervous to conduct the studies. In fact, according to the Washington Post, and yeah, I checked, it's not the New York Times, young academics are warned that researching guns is a good way to kill their careers. The worst part is that the NRA doesn't even really represent gun owners. If you follow the money, they actually represent 
gun manufacturers. Less than half of the NRA's funding comes from fees and membership dues. The majority of their cash comes from grants, royalty income, and advertising from companies like Midway USA, Springfield Armory, and Beretta. And this is where all the inconsistency and lies start to make sense. Nothing the organization is doing works out unless the NRA's bottom line is protecting the financial interests of their funders. They're using the American gun owners as a smokescreen to hide the fact that the gun industry is, very irresponsibly, marketing their guns by appealing to violent fantasies and insecurity. Because, as has been made clear by our movie and video games industry, these fantasies and insecurities are worth a shitload of cash. <laughs> This gun is called the PA-459, because 459 is a penal code for a burglary in progress. This is why gun sales always spike after a mass shooting. Some people are fantasizing about heroically getting the chance to gun down bad guys in a public place, which means the people who want to stop mass shootings with their guns and the people who want to commit mass shootings with their guns are having the same fundamentally unrealistic fantasy. The alternative is that people are buying guns after mass shootings because they're worried that the Democrats are coming to take them away. Well, here's the whole thing about that. In 2008, the NRA ran an article titled, Obama, Most Anti-Gun Candidate Ever Will Ban Guns. In 2012, NRA President Wayne LaPierre said that Obama endorsed a total ban on the manufacturer's sale and possession of all handguns. Meanwhile, in reality, under Obama, we only passed two laws related to gun ownership, and both expanded the rights of gun owners. Now, the NRA is making the same claim about Clinton. They consistently say this about Democrats because they're largely a Republican organization, even though the last president to seize Americans' guns was George W. Bush in 2005. But since the NRA had endorsed him for president, it'd be politically inconvenient for them to admit that. And now they're making the same claim about Clinton despite the total lack of evidence. Because the NRA doesn't really represent gun owners. Only one in 10 gun owners is a member, and yet they keep using language like this. Presidential hopeful Hillary Clinton is waging an all out war on guns and gun owners. She has called the NRA her number one enemy. They pretend that criticizing the NRA is the same as criticizing everybody who owns a gun, even though 90% of gun owners, like me and most people in my family, aren't members. It's pretty convincing. In fact, the model is so effective that other industries have tried to rip it off. In 1993, Philip Morris tried to start the National Smokers Alliance, hoping to create a generation of politically active smokers. The problem was that the image of the government coming and stealing everybody's smokes is cartoonishly stupid, unlike the NRA's image of the government coming and taking everybody's guns, which is just the boring kind of stupid. To stay relevant, the NRA has to keep gun owners scared, which means getting creative with what being a gun owner even means. Let's look at the difference between these NRA posters from before the revolt at Cincinnati and these ones from right after. Like, what is that second one even trying to say? Are you not a real gun owner unless you've blasted a burglar's leg off in front of your kids? Now look at this image from the front page of the NRA taken the day I wrote this. Again, and I think this is worth repeating, I'm not making a point about guns, but no matter what your stance, it's embarrassing to have an organization like this playing a major role in American politics. Once we get rid of all the people who seem to exist purely to spread confusion and outrage, we can finally get back to what politics is supposed to be about. Wait, why do we have politics? Thanks for watching that episode of Cracked Explains. Please like and subscribe and leave a comment telling us what other totally non-controversial, soft political issue we should talk about in a way that won't piss anybody off.